Well, thank you very much for uh, coming to the symposium. And, as, um, and I would especially like to thank the organizers for bringing me over. It's always a pleasure to be here. I was a graduate student in the mid-'80s here at UH, and so I always enjoy an opportunity to come back. And uh, my topic uh, today will be a little bit different from the others in that I'm not actually discussing parades explicitly. Um, but uh, it's a very closely connected topic. Notice in uh, Dr. Kurushima's uh, presentation today and also yesterday, he emphasized in uh, the mutuality of the uh, process. In other words, the uh, townspeople of Edo are watching the foreign envoys. The foreign envoys are putting on the best show that they can put on, but the uh, the Edo townspeople are also dressed in their best attire and behave on their best behavior, and it's a mutual process of each side or each each entity putting on a good impression, making a good impressions. So public relations, broadly defined, are an inherent part of these kind of public spectacles, and uh, that's uh, what I uh, will be arguing here with respect to the Ryukyu China relationship. Uh, the Ryukyu, China, or the Ming, you know, in other words, China in this case means the Ming and especially the Qing dynasties, uh, included uh, essential performative components with, uh, with the burden on the Ryukyuans to make a good impression on Chinese officials. Uh, the best and most important example was the process of royal investiture by the Chinese court. And indeed, insofar as the Ryukyuan court strove with considerable success to convey a good impression the investiture process possessed a parade-like quality. Uh, moreover, the Ryukyuan court skillfully nurtured a positive image in Chinese eyes in what we might call an early form of public relations management. So that's my basic argument. And now let's look at some of the details. But first, uh, a little bit of background. Again, some of you have a great deal of knowledge about these matters. Others don't. So I'm sort of assuming that you don't. Um, a few points about the Ryukyu Satsuma uh, relationship. Uh, Satsuma controlled Ryukyu's foreign relations to a point, but uh, this can be overstressed. Uh, it was absolutely essential for Ryukyuans to cooperate if Satsuma was to actually make a profit or get anything done. Uh, and uh, so it was early on there were some very many difficulties in this regard, and a, a, a process eventually of, in, evolved in which there was enough incentive on the Ryukyuans' part to cooperate with Satsuma. Um, uh, so uh, one requirement was uh, in this whole for this all to work was that Ryukyu needed to appear fully independent in Chinese eyes. That does not mean, by the way, that the, that Chinese officials were were fooled. They knew that Ryukyu was very closely tied with Japan and suspected uh, a, a degree of control. But as long as there was no obvious contradiction there, as long as the appearance was that of a foreign kingdom. You know, th th they just that was fine. So a lot of this was in the realm of appearances. Um, so one result of this requirement for, to appear independent was a sharp decrease in Japanese residence. Satsuma prohibited Japanese from residing in Ryukyu. Now there were there would be temporary residence of sailors on ships and and so forth, but but uh, very few permanent Japanese residents, and also. Another, exactly for the same reason, there was a strong increase in Chinese cultural influence from the mid-17th century and all through the 18th century. Uh, so uh, that was because of the need for Ryukyu to maintain its ties with China, which, is, which enabled it to remain quasi-independent vis-a-vis Satsuma's power in the north. Uh, it was, it was like in a sense, a barrier that Satsuma could not actually take over Ryukyu in a thoroughgoing way, but had to uh, rule it uh, in an indirect manner. Uh, so in this way, uh, Ryukyu was able to carve out a kind of autonomous space. Um, so um, as for elite Ryukyu in society, I would uh, simply mention that, uh, you know, that, that we could go into much more detail on this, but it's not, it's not directly relevant, but it comes up in the background. The, uh, that we do find uh, in a basic two-way division between, it's the same as in that sense, in, in a broad sense, it's similar to Japan where the, you have this formal division between commoners and samurai, uh, uh, kind of a legally speaking a two-class society. And the same thing evolves in Ryukyu. 
the, with, but, the, but there were differences in how the two groups were defined. So a, a Ryukyuan, uh, well, you can use different terms, Yukachu, uh, Keimochi, uh, kei Samurai, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, which obviously, you know, from, from Samurai, and, and others. But these Ryukyuan aristocrats uh, tended to define themselves in the manner of a Chinese scholar official more so than as warriors. Uh, even though the, the, their, their, their claim to aristocratic status might have come at, from warrior activities back in the past and their family records. Um, so um, I just want to emphasize this point, that the Chinese scholar official became the, sort of the model for Ryukyu and aristocrats. And let's not worry exactly about how Ryukyu and aristocrats were defined for, the, for this talk. Uh, go. Uh, <clears throat> Let me keep checking my time here. Okay, so beginning in the uh, late 14th century, uh, so we're going to take a quick look now at the very early Ryukyuan uh, Chinese relations. Um, we find that um, immigrant Chinese, uh, mostly seafaring merchants as far as we can tell, uh, conducted uh, trade with uh, between uh, the, the o kingdoms on Okinawa. It's at this point, we really can't call it Ryukyu. We just say Okinawa. Uh, and the, the three principalities, which later become one kingdom, um, uh, conduct their trade through Chinese seafaring merchants, who eventually settle in Kumemura, which is in documents often called Toei, uh, you know, Kuninda in, in uh, Okinawan, it would just be Kumemura in Japanese style pronunciation. Um, and, uh, but, but this idea that there was a, a, a one time sudden influx of 36 households into Kumemura that you see in, do, in, in the official histories is, is kind of in a, uh, there's no evidence for that. It was, it was a much messier and vague, more vague situation. This just became essentially the Chinatown uh, of um, these early Ryukyu relations. And the, um, uh, it's, today we find this image of a boat uh, pointing toward uh, Fujian province in, in China, it, here in, in Okinawa. In, in, as also pointing to the entryway of the uh, the, the Fujian uh, Park. Uh, so the oh, another an, another interesting example of some of these early Chinese immigrants is a guy named uh, Kaiki in at least in uh, Ryukyu and uh, documents, an ethnic Chinese and a Taoist uh, apparently. I mean, he was credited with having powers of Taoism, uh, who worked for the royal court and designed uh, the gardens. Uh, that are still that you can still see today. I can't remember if I have a more detailed shot of that. No, I don't. It's right here. Uh, but the Ryutan Gardens. Uh, uh, um, uh, so they, these were designed by a Chinese uh, Taoist practitioner in the employ of the royal court. Um, <clears throat> The royal court dispatched um, uh, students for, to formally to study in China. Uh, there were uh, 30 of these individuals um, in, during the Ming Dynasty, and then uh, th this continued after some hiatus uh, in, in the Qing Dynasty as well. Um, and after 1609, after the Satsuma invasion of Ryukyu in 1609, this is what really makes it essential that Ryukyu maintain its close ties with China and, in fact, to even increase those, the complexity of those ties, um, then um, um, talent in Chinese studies, chi knowledge of China, knowledge of Chinese language, knowledge of Chinese protocol and customs became essential. And Kumemura, which, which so Kumemura had originated uh, as, I'm sorry, going the wrong direction, I'm going back here. Kumemura had originated as this sort of Chinatown where the seafaring merchants congregated. Uh, it then transforms after 1609 into sort of a, a magnet for the talent from all around uh, Shuri and Naha area uh, uh, and drawing them into Kumemura. So actually we have a lot of immigrants in the sense of Okinawans coming into Kumemura, taking Chinese names and, and becoming experts in Chinese studies and so forth, essentially becoming, you know, sort of false uh, Nisei Chinese, you know, kind of uh, situation. Sion was an example of that. His, his, his parents actually both originated, both his family uh, lines from outside of Kumemura. Uh, uh, but um, so, so Kumemura becomes an, uh, a magnet for talent. And um, uh, in addition to the formal study at the National Academy in China, the so-called Kansho system, in which uh, four students would be selected to, to 
to formally study in China, a much larger number of Ryukyuans from Kumemura studied in China, mostly in Fujian, but also in, sometimes in surrounding provinces, uh, studied specialized topics in, unofficially in what is today known as the Kingaku, uh, not, not really system, but just the phenomenon of Kingaku. And uh, I just have some examples here. Uh, uh, Sai Choko, for example, studied the calendar, which was a, a big, very important matter to, to be able to produce a proper calendar. Uh, Ma Heiko uh, uh, studied sugar production, which becomes vitally important economically for the Ryukyu Kingdom. Uh, Riku Tokusen, and these guys, by the way, all have other names. I'm just using their Chinese-style name, but with you know, you know Okinawan pronunciation. Uh, 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 studied white sugar and how to make other varieties of sugar, so a refinement of the sugar process. Uh, Gi Shitetsu uh, was a surgeon who specialized in lip surgery um, and is, 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 uh, has, uh, has a monument to him. Um, and uh, Tei Junsoku is rather famous, you might have heard of him, uh, brings over other, the Rikuyu Engi and other Chinese texts and is a diplomat uh, involved heavily in, in, in Chinese uh, diplomacy. Uh, on Motoku, um, uh, tongue surgery, and the, we can go on and on with the musicians and other, but, but notice that all the technical areas of, of, of uh, you know, that, of medicine, uh, music, sugar production, the calendar, etc., that uh, China was, had become, in general, the source of knowledge about these things for Ryukyu. Now, there was also some knowledge from Japan, too, but, uh, but China was the main source. <clears throat> and so, in this context, uh, making a good impression uh, uh, is essential. And uh, I want to make, now go into a little bit more about specifics about how uh, Ryukyuans during the 17th and especially the 18th and early 19th centuries uh, uh, in various ways uh, presented the Ryukyu kingdom to Chinese eyes in the best possible light. Uh, and the, the main opportunity for this was, of course, partly when Ryukyuans themselves went to China, but also especially when the Ryukyuan envoys came to Ryukyu, because then, you know, Ryukyu is right there before their eyes, as opposed to Ryukyuans in China telling them about Ryukyu. And so this investiture process, which uh, and, uh, had so much significance for the kingdom, uh, symbolic significance, this was the opportunity to present a good image. The, Ryuki, the Chinese envoys always wrote a detailed account, a book-length account of their, uh, of, of their time in Ryukyu. They, they wrote about Ryukyu and customs, history, etc. Uh, and, and so all this becomes recorded. And, and so the good impression isn't just a, a passing thing. It's a matter of getting this good impression into the official record that then subsequent Chinese envoys would rely on. Um, and the first thing I would point out is, uh, well, let me just uh, point out, here's a map that's a rather famous map showing here's Satsuma and I put some labels on Mami, Okinawa, and then across to Fujian. Of course, it's not a map to perfect scale, but just showing the route that Ryukyuans would, might travel. Um, and the, um, uh, the poetry, we see Chinese poetry is, becomes an important element in uh, the education of any uh, Ryukyuan especially in Kumemura. Uh, now, other Ryukyuan elites wrote Japanese poetry. Japanese culture was also known in Okinawa. Some studied Japanese and learned Japanese. There's a whole other side, in other words, that, that there with the Japan connection. Uh, but I'm focusing in this talk on the China connection. I just want to, but I just do, do want to let you know that, you know, there, there's, there's, it's very much two sides to all this. Um, so uh, poetry exchange and the ability to write a good poem uh, was the kind of lubricant, as I like to say, of that making the gears of, of diplomatic exchange go smoothly. So it, it's a form of recreation, uh, it's an, an, an enjoyment, of course, but it's, but it's an essential way of interacting with Chinese uh, and to show that you're sophisticated, civilized, have, a, have a, you know, the sufficient literary background. And so you know, it's a way to show off your learning in this uh, guise of, uh, of recreation. 
Uh, <coughs> so, for example, uh, when uh, Xu Bao Guang, we, we saw him mentioned uh, yesterday in the presentations of you were here, uh, his account, uh, I'll just use the, the, the more common uh, Chu Zan Den Xin Roku name, you, know, you can pronounce it in Chinese if you'd like, since it's in Chinese, uh, ends with poems uh, presenting as parting gifts uh, uh, to the envoys by the king and leading Ryukyuan officials. In other words, the very ending is this big parting gift of poems. Uh, and in a different example, in 1761, a group of Ryukyuan students in Beijing uh, made, uh, I'm sorry I said mad here, made a good impression on their host by presenting a book of poems they wrote in honor of the Empress Dowager's 70th birthday. It's a big event when you reach your 70th birthday. Uh, and so the ability to write a good poem was not just a nice little flourish, but an essential quality of, of making a good impression. Um, <clears throat> Another aspect of making a good impression of good public relations would be uh, official histories translated to please Chinese eyes. Right? So there's actually, we see in the major works of Ryukyu that were produced in the Kinsei, the early modern era, we find there's usually one version in, basically in Japanese, although sometimes it'll have quotes from Chinese sources stuck in there that are in Chinese, but basically a Japanese language version and a Chinese version. And it's often not just a translation. It's a transposition uh, uh, with, with considerably different content uh, in many uh, instances. And so, uh, for example, uh, if we take the, um, um, the, the choose on Seikon, uh, uh, that becomes the choose on Seifu in, uh, in its Chinese version. And that actually has two different iterations. Um, and we see a considerable different, I mean, it's not radically different, but a, a di definitely a different slant on things in the, in the Chinese version. And the same with other uh, texts, such as the Ryukyu Koku Ryuraiki, uh, uh, then has a its own Chinese version as well, the Kyuki. Um, and so, uh, <coughs> just to, I just pull out an example almost at random here, the, the uh, section on Shuri in the Ryukyu Koku Kyuki, in other words, uh, the Chinese version has a lengthy discussion of geomancy. Uh, which in um, Okinawan context would be chidi, you know, not geography exactly, but more like feng shui, you know, uh, fu sui, geomancy. Um, it begins by explaining that uh, uh, nothing was more important than, I'm sorry, I've got a lot of typos in here, I'm just noticing, geomancy to the uh, sage kings of old in establishing the capital of their state. Uh, in other words, transposing geomancy, which was currently in, say, the 18th century, an important new technology that had come into Ryukyu from China, and reading that back into Ryukyu's uh, uh, past. Um, and, uh, uh, or in the Chuzan Seifu, we find, especially in Sion's re rewriting of it, a, um, uh, a creating of Ryukyu's past, making it into a moral drama centered on the kingdom's line of monarchs, hence the name uh, Seifu, literally genealogy. Um, as opposed to a, and minimizing the military aspects and, and, and force and, and coercive force in, in the mixture. And we could, this is a whole topic that we could discuss at length, but uh, I have to be brief. So uh, here also was an opportunity to make a good impression. The Chinese envoys read these Chinese versions of the official histories. They also noted there's a Japanese version too, which we can't read. Wonder if that's the same. I mean, they they were a little suspicious, but you know, they they, they read the ones that they were presented with. Um, now, another important aspect, especially in the Chinese eyes, of making a good impression was getting your ritual matters all in order. I mean, uh, foreign relations in these days was uh, li uh, in Chinese, uh, rei in Japanese, ritual. Uh, that was the basis of it, and. Um, so, uh, in 1863, the Qing investiture envoy, uh, Wang Ji, uh, viewed the royal tablets at So Genji in, in Okinawa and uh, wrote that their order seemed to be random. It just didn't make sense to him. Um, Shunten was in the middle uh, as uh, the great progenitor of the line, flanked by Aso and Sato. The arrangement did not make sense to Wang, uh, who had expected to see the customary uh, Chinese Zhao Mu order uh, with the dynastic founder in the middle and then even numbered reigns, two, four, six, et cetera, to his left and the odd numbered reigns to the right. Uh, the Ryukyuan logic, in, on, by contrast, had the most important founding figure flanked by the founders of two other ancient lines 
followed by the kings of the current second Shou dynasty. So here they are in that uh, 1863 arrangement that baffled uh, um, the, uh, that, that was baffling. And so we have Shunten here in the middle, and then the Aso line founder Aso, and the Sato line founder Sato, and then the second Shou dynasty kings, and then the first Shou dynasty kings and earlier. Uh, it just, it made sense by Ryukyu and logic, it, but it made no sense to the Chinese. And, and so the, when, you know, the, obviously the Ryukyu officials knew that the Chinese visitors were baffled by this, and, and, they, and, and so as part of a general revision of protocol that included not only this matter, but other things that we don't have time to go into, um, they, uh, when uh, um, uh, the next envoy uh, arrived, Xu Baoguang, uh, he, uh, he was aware, he was on the lookout for the strange arrangement, and he was happy to see that everything was back and that things had been put in the proper, normal order with uh, 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 Xun Ten right in the middle and then the uh, first show dynasty and earlier, uh, you know, out to the right and, and left and then the second show. And in other words, they're treating the whole thing uh, as one line, one continuous line, uh, even though there were actually breaks in it uh, and with, you know, the, the proper uh, even numbered, I'm sorry, even numbered and odd numbered uh, order just going all the way on out from the founder. Um, but interestingly, I think that's on the next slide. Uh, yes, the uh, the <clears throat> we have two things. We have the So Genji with all the king's tablets. Then we have another arrangement of tablets uh, in Enkakuji, the Buddhist temple, uh, with only the second Shou dynasty. That's why you might notice there's difference here in the order because that's just the second Shou dynasty. They also were arranged in a peculiar Buddhist arrangement that was different from the Chinese order. They were rearranged to be put in the proper Chinese order. So the Chinese envoys took note of that and said, they're very good, very good. And then as soon as the Chinese envoys left, they were rearranged back into the, uh, uh, to the, the, the Buddhist order in, in, in Kakuji. So notice that some of this is very much just to make a good impression you know, for the envoys. And then when they leave, we change it back. Um, the um, uh, investiture envoys stayed in Okinawa for several months, as we saw uh, in the presentations last time, and thus it was a particularly opportune, uh, there were many opportunities to make good impressions on them, and you, you really had to plan carefully how to do this. Um, so it turns out that one way to do this was Kumi Odori, which was not created originally for this purpose at all, and indeed had, it had some, well, it was a, it's a kind of a complex art form to be appropriated in this way. But it was created by Tamagusuku Chokun. Uh, here are his terminal dates. He traveled to Japan five times where he studied the dramatic arts, you know, no Kyogen and so forth. And so it's, a, it's heavily Japanese influenced in, in, that, in its uh, 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 creation, but, also, but it draws on Ryukyu and themes and, and other sources as well. And this became a perfect uh, vehicle for making a good impression on uh, Chinese envoys. The first known performance for the envoys was in 1719 at a banquet uh, to entertain uh, the envoys. And uh, uh, Xu, in his account that we've uh, seen, uh, um, <coughs> describes the second of, of these plays as Tsuru and, Kane, and Kame, two sons avenge the fa their father, a reference to um, uh, this, uh, some, uh, some, an, a different, uh, a to, to Nido Teki, uh, Tekiuchi, in which two boys avenged their enemy. It's based on the conflict between Gosamaru and Amawari. The reason I'm hesitating is that to go into, there's a very complicated story between these two. But basically, we have these two ancient uh, lords in the first Shou dynasty who are, um, have this very complicated relationship, and they're, they're uh, both play, it's, it's, it's a political power play, and in the end, Shu summarizes the plot uh, without commenting on it, but the play, uh, the bottom line is the play transforms the violent events con uh, connected with the early formation of the kingdom into a cultural drama that highlights loyalty and filial piety. Uh, and that's what all, uh, so many of these plays do, is they take, you know, violent military events and, and transform them into moral plays. Right. The most famous, perhaps, was um, is Koko no Maki, Tale 
of filial piety. Uh, and uh, this is based on the semi-legendary King Gihon. I mean, he's existed, but we don't really know much about him. Um, and uh, supposedly a filial son and daughter from a poor household offer themselves as sacrifices to appease a violent dragon and thus provide money for their family. It was the daughter actually had to make the sacrifice. Uh, and so it resonates with Chinese tales of dutiful women giving up their lives for some higher cause of loyalty or filial piety, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, uh, owing to her steadfast filial piety, the cosmic forces intervened to provide a happy outcome for her and everyone else involved. Um, and, and in 1880, the investiture envoy Li Ding, uh, Li Ding Yuan, I'm trying to pronounce it halfway decently in Chinese, but I'm failing, uh, saw his episode and uh, was, saw the episode, he was moved by it, and he um, uh, devoted considerable space in his writing to summarizing and quoting from the play. Uh, uh, at the end, he commented, his final comment in his, his discussion, uh, for heaven to reward filial behavior is deeply satisfying. You know, this, uh, apparently succeeded, we made a good impression uh, on uh, Lee, the uh, imperial investiture envoy. Uh, and to be effective in good PR, you have to do your homework. Uh, so there was at least one more event that Lee found deeply satisfying. And the 11th uh, day of the 10th month was his mother's birthday. And he had, he had not told anybody this. Uh, but Lee um, uh, you know, wanted to keep it uh, quiet. And Ryukyu and officials had done their research. They found this out. Uh, and royal envoys surprised Lee with gifts of uh, five elegant fans, an incense burner, and a commemorative longevity manuscript. Uh, so the event led to a celebratory feast with the Ryukyuan envoys, and Lee was absolutely delighted at this display of, uh, of uh, uh, proper, uh, fill, you know, of, of, um, you know, sort of um, honoring his mother and, and, and the uh, care that the Ryukyuans had taken to make a good impression. And so for these, uh, let me just uh, uh, go run through the list of the, the, uh, the items. Uh, we have poetry, official histories translated to please, uh, setting up the ceremony, ceremonial forms just right. Of, and one example of that is, is the tablets and other examples I don't have time to go into. Um, the uh, use of kumi odori uh, with, with plays that focus on things like loyalty and filial piety based on Ryukyu and themes uh, and, uh, or on uh, filial piety, in this case, devotion, uh, uh, willingness to give up one's life for, for a greater good. Uh, all combined to make a good impression, uh, and that's why I argue that this whole process of dealing with the Chinese envoys and so forth had this performative dimension, uh, very much like uh, a, a parade, uh, but on you know the manifesting itself in many different kinds of cultural uh, realms. So I'll stop at this point, and uh, it, we can discuss the details of these things more uh, during the question and answer period. Thank you very much.